Well, thank you all for coming. What a great turnout here at the Mentor Public Library. With that being said, our program today is brought to you by Ohio State University Extension, the Lake County Master Gardeners. We are part of Ohio State, and there are four parts to Extension, Family and Consumer Sciences, 4-H, Youth Development, and sometimes we overlap with 4-H. We help them, they help us. Community Development, and where we line up is the Agriculture and Natural Resources end of the uh, Extension. This is a great reference for you to use. It's the ohioline.osu.edu. So we're going to start with our little commercials for Ohio State. This is our main location in Painesville. We're right in the center of downtown, and this is also a great reference. It's uh, the lakeosu.edu website. So you can find lots of things that we're gonna talk about today at these two sites. And I will reference them later in the, in the program. We also have started up our Master Gardener Hotline, Tuesdays only from 9 to 11, April through October. So if you have a gardening question or problem, you can call between these hours and you'll get a live person, Master Gardener volunteer, who will be glad to help you to answer your question. And if she or he cannot answer, they will be glad to do some more digging and referencing and get an answer back to you. So that's our little commercial for today. Today's program is Wake Up the Garden. So spring is here. Some days are sunny and some are cold, some are warm, but we are in transition. The calendar tells us the vernal equinox happened. We are in spring. The meteorological calendar told us March 1st was spring, but do we feel like it's spring? Not really, not the last couple of weeks. We had we did like a 180 after St. Patrick's Day. So when is it time to uncover the bulbs? When is it time to go out and weed? Can I buy new plants? When should I put them in the ground? So we're gonna answer these questions for you today and many others, but I'm here to tell you, let's just enjoy what we got. Maybe some of you are still looking out your window. We had snow in Mentor yesterday, not to any amounts, and we've had not a lot of snow all winter. So these pictures just show you some ideas of what you can see out your window. While it's still kind of dreary and cold and drab out there, plants for interest that you could plant in your garden. It's a good time to reevaluate your garden. Can we think about what we'd like to see in the garden? Maybe you see all the forsythia blooming. I don't have one, maybe I wanna put one in next year. Maybe it's something like the winter aconites that were bloom at the Holden Arboretum a couple weeks ago. The crested iris, things like that. All of these things provide a longer gardening season for us and a great view out of our window. Maybe it's something as simple as planting um, an evergreen to provide shelter for the birds and a view for you out your window. What about the witch hazel? They're beautiful, mine are done. Mine bloomed in February. It's great to see something blooming that early, isn't it? With gardeners and people interested in plants, we love to have that garden blooming as much as we can. The hellebores have been beautiful this year. Get out and enjoy them. If you don't know what those are, they look, they've been blooming for weeks now and Holden has a great display of them. So get out and take a look at those too. Some other things, the crocuses, the snowdrops, they're done. Daffodils are almost done. So it's talking about stretching our year a little bit by what we can add out there in the winter time, what we can look at. Now this person left the yucca, the variegated yucca showing through the snow with the seed head still on them. That's kind of an interesting thing to see out your window in the winter time. We're in our houses a long time in the winter. So anything you can do to create interest is, is wonderful. This gardener also left the mop heads on her hydrangea for winter interest. So these are some of the things you can do. Um, instead of har you know, harvesting them in the fall, I like to cut mine off and use them in the arrangements in my house. And they just are beautiful. But if you leave them up, it's just another thing that will draw attention to your landscape. When can we get out into the garden and do that winter cleanup? Well, I was speaking with somebody earlier who's already done weeding in her garden, but it was also dry two weeks ago. Right now, it's not too dry in our gardens. I walked in mine yesterday with my boots on because it's pretty squishy. So you don't want to damage your soils by walking on 
the wet soils, you'll compact the soils. Now these other things that I'm gonna talk about, like cutting off your stems. Well, there's a new way of thinking. This is based on research and things that have come through the years. This presentation has been around a long time, but I left it in there because some gardeners do like to get out there and cut off, off everything and clean up all the leaves. But I'm here to tell you, please leave them up for a while yet. The insects use those stems and those leaves to call home all winter long. They are overwintering. A lot of them do not leave this area. So if you can leave your stems up, leave your leaf litter lightly in your gardens, it's, it's very advantage of, advantageous to the insects and the creatures that call it home. I also tell you like to mark your, your plants for like those snowdrops are going to be gone. They'll be dormant, but maybe you want to spread them around your yard or give them to your neighbor. So mark the plants now while you can still see the foliage. Uh, and also things like maybe the sedums have been pushing up through the frost and the, the ground. It's a good time to go walk out there and stop them down a little bit. What about repairing winter damage? This year hasn't been a bad year. I had my damage last August. <laughs> and we just repaired most of it by January. The house was recited. The garden is still in flux because obviously things are just coming up. And I'm not sure what that's gonna look like after everybody tromped through and cut down 20, 20 plus trees in the, a wooded area. But if you have damage to be repair, do it now. I like to think about repairing this damage <laughs> before spring starts so that I can enjoy the new growth and the new beauty of spring. We had a lot of damage at my house, but I was ready to be done with it all. So take the last couple of, you know, if you have a walkway to repair, which we had a contractor out, he's coming back because it wasn't quite done right. So because it was damaged in the tornado also. But so take the time to take a look at the damage and do some repairs. And if you can't do it yourself, like a large tree like this, call the contractors. They'll be uh, glad to come out and take care of your trees for you, although it is expensive. I'm here to tell you that too. And one thing to trim the oak trees only while they're dormant. So if you have a contract, because we do have an oak wilt uh, disease caused by be beetles, that is a problem. So you don't want to be trimming oak trees while they're green. And in general, we're going to talk about pruning, it's a good idea to trim things when they're dormant. You can see the structure a little bit easier. You can get in there and make some good cuts. We'll talk about pruning a little further on. So I have March still in this slide, <laughs> but because a lot of times this program is done early in March, but it's still not too late because of our winter weather, you know, we had a, we backslid a little bit. So people, like I said, I've eaten out of my deck. It was very warm. And we put, pulled out the furniture. Some people have weeded, things like that. So that was okay as long as the grounds were stable and not mushy to walk on. But you can still start cool season crops indoors. Cool season, the broccolis, the kales, the coal plants, uh, radishes, Swiss chard, you can still do those indoors if that's how you like to do it. Some of these can be directly seeded outdoors. Tender tubers like the caladiums, the uh, uh, dahlias, the calla lilies, start th those could be started, mine are already about a foot high. I had some old calla lilies that I dug up and, and wintered over in my basement. Did anybody get to a maple syrup pancake breakfast last month. That was a big one in March. Yeah, they, Burton, every, everybody had them and it was a great thing to do in the winter time. And what about starting some of those peppers and tomatoes, those cultivars that we maybe can't find at our local garden centers? So late March, you're, you're not too late now. My husband's just starting our things right now. It depends on where you, when you think you're going to be putting them out. Remember, if the conditions are dry, you can prepare the soil or have a soil test done. If it's wet, you don't want to go into the wet soils. Let them dry out thoroughly. Somebody asked me a couple of weeks ago, planting peas at St. Patrick's Day? Well, that's a traditional thing. But if you remember, St. Patrick's Day was pretty warm and dry. We were out at a, a gathering the Saturday before. We were all outside, which was unheard of. So it's still a good time to do some of these things. Um, hardscape the paths, like I said, correct uh, the poor drainage if you can. And it's still time to prune some of those trees and shrubs that are deciduous and that you can still get to. And we're gonna talk about pruning right now. So what are some of the reasons to prune? To keep the size and the shape of the tree or the shrub intact. Maybe it's in front of your window and it's getting too big and it's blocking your view. It's a reason to prune. 
the health of the plant, most plants do better if they are pruned occasionally. It stimulates new growth. It also will increase fruit or flower production, like your apple trees, your brambles, things like that should, have, should all be pruned while they're dormant. And then sometimes you want to renovate your shrubs and trees. And sometimes you're sacrificing bloom if you're doing it now. Know when your plants are blooming. Forsythias are blooming now, right? We don't want to cut them down now. We want to enjoy their beauty. But when they're done is a time to go after them. So if they're getting too big or too scraggly, that's the time to go after them. Up to, you can remove up to a third of the plant material. It's called rejuvenation planting. You can cut down to the ground, you can do some trimming around the top, but as long as you don't remove more than one third of the plant, your plant will rejuvenate itself and come back even stronger and healthier. So if you see those old piles of, or brambles, piles that have forsythia put in them, they'd just do better off if they could get some pruning in there. And it does help the good of the shrubs. This picture kind of shows you there's the before uh, branch on the left and the person with their pruners there is going uh, right above a, bud, a, a sprout because they're going to direct the prune by directing the prune. They're, prune, they're directing the uh, growth to the right on this last side. So when you think about pruning, think about which direction you want to stimulate the growth because you are stimulating growth when you're pruning. So if you can think about, you know, like on an apple tree, I, I stimulate my growth outward, keep an open crown so that the wind, the air, the light can all get in there. And you're gonna to wanna to do the same with some of your shrubs and, and things too. Last month, people were thinking about pruning things, but it was a little early. <laughs> and honestly, even now, we're, it's been too cold. Like I said, I haven't been out in my yard in a couple of weeks. It's been, it's been too cold and wet. But April is a good time to think about, if you haven't done your fruit trees and some of your other brambles and things, go out there and do them now before they wake up. It's also time where you can see the crossing branches so if you got crossing branches, you're going to creating a, a vector for disease as they rub. You're going to create an area that disease and insects can get into. So it's good to cut out anything that's crossing and redirect your growth in another direction. A lot of people are, are trimming rose bushes. A lot of people last month wanted to trim rose bushes. However, I always caution wait a little bit longer because the roses are just starting to grow. They're just getting their flush. Okay, if you cut too soon, you might cut some of that off. Sometimes it's hard to tell. If you, you know, you cut them in the fall, but you're gonna go back and do some more cleaning up um, to let the air in and direct the growth a little bit. Okay, so we wanna talk about using the right tools for the job. Anything that is about a half inch or di in diameter or less, you can use your uh, snippers or your anvil pruners with that. If you have bigger branches up to two inches, you're gonna to wanna to do the loppers, the ones that you have to operate with two hands. And if you have anything bigger than two inches, you're probably gonna use a, a saw. And with a saw pulls, on the pull stroke is when you get your cut on the saw. Make sure that those tools are sharp. Take the time now to sharpen your tools. Make sure they're oiled, cleaned, and especially if you're trimming boxwood, I know I trim, do this every year. I, have, I trim every boxwood and I clean the tools in between to try to prevent disease going from one shrub to the next. So uh, sanitation is very important. This illustration is showing you if you're cutting a branch on a large tree, maybe it's broken at the tip. <laughs> like I had a lot broken at the tips <laughs> in my yard. But um, so maybe uh, we need to think about how we're approaching this. We don't want to just come up to the uh, trunk of the tree and make a clean cut because what could happen is you might create it, the bark to tear as you're creating that clean cut. So they're showing an illustration. The first cut is going to be underneath the branch, up, out an inch or two, and you cut a part, part of the way, and then you step back further, you make your second cut above. What that does, it takes some of the weight of that branch off of the stem or the trunk of the tree, and then you should make your third cut, final cut next to the tree. You won't, hopefully you won't tear or create more issues as you prune a large tree like that. So here's a couple of examples of 
part of my yard that wasn't touched by the, hur the hurricane, the tornado. <laughs> this apple tree is over 30 years old, and it is a dwarf, semi-dwarf. It's not a true standard apple tree, but I can and still do prune it from the ground with shears and a pole saw every year. So it is possible to keep these things in check. Uh, just another view of the apple tree in, in our garden. This is a picture of the front of my house, which was built in 1979. Uh, the original landscaping was installed by the previous owner. We bought it in 81, so I inherited young landscaping. But these hemlock trees that I have been pruning that frame the front door in the garage, they are over 30 years old. And hemlock trees, if, if you would look online to see how big can a hemlock tree grow, maybe they weren't the right choice to put there because they can and will grow 60 to 70 feet tall. If you go through Penitentiary Glen and you go through the gorge, the hemlock trees are all over the place, growing very tall. But these have been by my house. And by the way, most landscape plants will not last as long as this has lasted. And I'm starting to see some signs of issues with some of my hemlock trees right now. Of course, they've been pruned for 40 years almost. So most landscape plants last about 20, 10 to 20 years. But that goes back to the whole issue of putting the right plant in the right place. So if you're planting these hemlock trees, maybe stick them further in your yard where they have room to grow. Or your apple trees in the sun. You want to make sure you're planting in the right spot to keep your landscape viable. My husband likes the way the British landscape. Have you ever seen any of those shows? They don't do any landscaping around their foundation at all. They landscape their yards beautifully, but the, around the house, because I, you know, for obvious reasons, I mean, we are inviting creatures and critters and just something to think about. This is another front shot of my yard that is now, it's now gray, by the way, not yellow, <laughs> because I didn't have a choice with yellow. But anyway, this is all original landscaping and it's still there. By pruning, you can keep the integrity of your landscaping alive for many years. On the other hand, I used to work at this facility. It's the Lake Metro Parks Children's Schoolhouse. And I, I manage the facility and the programming. And that very large shrub that you see in the front, it's actually three snowball viburnum bushes together. But they have been improperly pruned for many years by shearing, just going over the top. The landscape crews, they're, they're basically lawn people. They get out there and they're, they're mowing like crazy. I mean, every spring and summer, they're not really into some of the pruning and maintenance chores, even though they'll, you know, if the director calls and says, hey, somebody's complaining, they can't get around the path because this is the path that the kids come with their parents from the parking lot and walk to the front door. So this beautiful shrub we had to remove, totally. It was too far gone to be saved. So it's an example of pruning done badly. So I'm not saying that they were pruned by bad people, I'm just saying that over the years you're making some of your own mistakes and you have to think about your idea of what you're doing when you prune. Soil samples tell us a lot about what nutrients are in our soils. Now nutrients can change. Rain can change them. The soil structure itself it is a starting point for your soils and your nutrients that are in there. But over the years, you can deplete nutrients. So you might want to co consider, I'm considering a soil sample for my one shrub that's in danger right now. I've tried other things, but you don't really know what you don't know. So what is it missing? The soil sample will tell you that. And I'm not going to get into the directions of how to do this, but I'm just telling you, if you haven't done one, or if you're creating a new bed, or if you have a problem, that's probably a good time to test your soil. Every three years or so is really what's necessary. Our soils are very rich in nutrients and lean more toward the acidic side. But the soil sample, the test, will tell you exactly what you're lacking and what to apply. Our office has, and our website has lots of good information. You know, if you're digging soils, you're gonna wanna, if you have one garden, dig three soil samples, combine it, and it gives you all the details online. So I'm not going there today, but it, it, and then some stores do have soil samples available. I've heard people using those, and those are very reputable too. So if you have a problem, consider a soil sample, or if you're creating a new bed. 
Uh, this is an old brochure. I asked for an update on this, but I believe that our soil samples now go through Penn State because we used to have our own uh, sample lab at Ohio State, which is our based our ag school in Ohio here, but then they stopped doing the samples and they went to Massachusetts. Now I believe it's Penn State's taking our samples. But it's, it's a good first step if you are having a problem or you haven't done a soil sample in a while. It's an important step. So, is it spring? Well, this year, in the vernal, I didn't change the, the picture because the uh, start of spring is either the 19th, 20th, or the 21st. That's usually when the vernal equinox, same day, daylight, same darkness happens, and that's really the first day of spring. But it's really been transition. I mean, everything started blowing up two weeks ago, and then it kind of stopped. And like our videographer here was saying, it's okay because um, the magnolias, they held on. They didn't all get burnt. My neighbors who, who even had white magnolias, the star magnolias already out, they still held on. They didn't totally get burnt. Some years, these poor magnolias, you plant them, the frost comes, and then they're brown. And there's your whole year gone because you only plant them for this beauty in the spring. So it is spring, but we are in that transition. And we're going to we're going to persevere and we're going to get into April gardening. So it is time to set out your cold weather crops as long as your soils are dry. Mine are not. Um, you can put out your carrots, your potatoes, things like that now. You can even put out your transplants if you and I am always advising have a fence because we have an area next coming up with the critters are coming back. You know, we're waking up our gardens and the critters are waking up too. So use a fence if you're putting any of your tender annuals out there already, like the cold weather crops. You can unburden un, uh, your roses if you cover them up. I don't, so they just might have to be trimmed a little bit. It's okay to reseed your thin lawn, but don't think about this as a major project. Uh, the best time to seed or create a new lawn is in the fall. Now, if you are feeding your lawn, a lot of lawn care companies have been around my neighborhood like three weeks ago. I don't feed my lawn that much, but I do occasionally put fertilizer on. If you have a issue with crabgrass, you probably knew that in the fall. The crabgrass was in your lawn. Now is the time before the forsythias are done blooming in your area to put that pre-emergent crabgrass control down. If you don't have crabgrass, don't, don't use a pre-emergent. The pre-emergent will create a barrier across your whole lawn. And you don't want to dig into it once you've applied it. You want to let it work. You also don't want to seed any spaces because that pre-emergent will negate the seed. You won't get uh, any germination off that seed. So you want to um, make sure that you're using a product correctly. A lot of times, I'm not I'm not the first to put product down on anything <laughs> in my yard. I'm just a little, I like it a little bit more natural, I guess. Lawn care, some of my yard actually looks like this brown stuff in the front. I get my neighbor had a very, for years he, he cultivated a bent lawn grass. Now, I don't know if you know what bent lawn is, but bent is something that they use at the gra uh, some of the golf courses. It can be trimmed very tight. But some of that seed has gotten around the neighborhood and I have some bent <laughs> in my front lawn. And this year, it's brown, be where the bent is. I've gone out there and I've raked it up. Um, I didn't have snow mold, which I think this is a better picture for snow mold. We didn't have a lot of snow that laid on the grasses this year. So we hopefully don't have that kind of damage. But, and most of my neighbor's grasses look beautiful already, but a lot of them have fertilized already. You do wanna keep some thatch in your lawn up to about two inches is good. So if you have a mower that is a thatching mower, don't bag it. Leave the thatch, get back, and it's the best thing you can do for your lawn. We're not talking about, you know, been gone for three weeks, now my grass is this high. No, 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 don't do it. You have to like start in the spring, start small, or if you come back from vacation and your grass is this high, you know not to cut more than a third off. So you're gonna probably Take this, bag the top, come back another time, maybe do another bag depending how high and how much fertilizer. See how much fertilizer you put in your lawn will determine how fast your grass is gonna grow. Also, well, the last thing I wanted to tell you about lawns is what's your threshold? Like my threshold for, I'll take, except a few weeds, 
I accept in my back lawn, I don't put down like a product for the skunks because we do get them digging a little bit. So my threshold is maybe a little bit different. I know I answered a question for somebody last week about, well, can I put down these products and does it affect the birds and the critters that eat the grass? Well, there are organic products you can use too. That's not always the answer. There's a lot of work involved with organic lawn care. So just things to think about. And what is your threshold for weeds? The other day, I pulled out a lesser celadine. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. It's highly invasive. Yellow flowers blooming right now in my front grass. <laughs> so these, the, and they're, if you don't catch them, they will spread. They, they're taking over the parks and everybody's, some people's yards that they think that they're the marsh marigold because they're very yellow blooming right now. But the marsh marigold is a totally different creature, has different leaves, different habit, habitat needs. It needs more water. But this highly invasive lesser celadine is there. So you want to make sure that you're out there. And I don't have a threshold for that. I want that gone. So I went out there with my you know, little shovel. And, I, and you have to make sure you get the whole root, sort of like a dandelion. If you don't get that tip of that root, you get another dandelion. So the same thing with this lesser celadine. If you don't get the whole thing, you get more lesser celadine. And it becomes very invasive. Animals won't eat it. So you can see it becomes a problem. So we're going to talk about fertilizers and pH and what that's all about. The pH is something that makes most soil nutrients available at about 6.5. And I'm going to go to the next slide because you can see the, the best pH is about 6.5 for most plants to take up the nutrients. And this is where the soil test comes in again. Most of us, most Northeast Ohio so soils go toward the acidic side. It's also easier to make soils more alkaline than acidic. If you're making it more alkaline, you're adding limestone, things like that. If you, have, if you need to add acid, then you're, you're adding sulfur products whether it's pelletized or powdered, but the pH will tell you, you know, what is available and what your uh, plants need. And every plant will need something different. My husband's gotten into hydroponic growing since last year. Somebody gave him a little kit and we've already eaten bok choy that he, because we grow a community garden. Well, because uh, we had all shade. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to the community garden this year, but I'm not sure if that'll continue because we have more sun now, but we couldn't grow anything in our home garden. But so he started bok choy. We tried to put that in our community garden many years ago, but, but bok choy is a very cold weather crop. So sort of like some of your uh, Chinese cabbages and other lettuce, head lettuces and things. So he noticed between the bok choy we already harvested and ate, and the new plants that he planted, his acid was a little bit off. The plant wasn't growing as he thought it should. So he actually added some vinegar to his little water solution. You can do it in different ways, but that's what he chose to do. And it really gave a boost to this bok choy plant, these bok choy plants that he's growing. So it is an important thing not to be looked at lightly, but you can do get pH tests in your uh, garden centers too, just to see what exactly is out there and what kind of um, fertilizers or what amendments you might need. I would, you know, a lot of people ask me, should I just put lime down? I got moss. Well, I can't just recommend that. You might have moss because it's really shady. You might have moss because your soils are really dense. It might not just be because of the pH. So we're not going to recommend you do that until you actually do some testing. Now, the other thing is fertilizer. They all have numbers on the bag, right? 30, 10, 20, that first bag has. This is a percentage of what's in that bag. And by the way, that first bag, 30, 10, 20, it's got a total of 60% product the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium, and 40% of the fill. Because if you ever need to fertilize your lawn, you know that's not all fertilizer. Well, there's a lot of fill product in these bags of fertilizer. So the nitrogen a number is the first number, the N. And that is for general greening. So in the spring, that's probably the number you're going to look for high on your, on your lawn fertilizers. It'll 
the lawn's going to green anyway. But most products will sh they'll sell you a high nitrogen number on your uh, grass uh, fertilizers. The the second number is phosphorus, and the phosphorus is used for a growing, blooming and shoots and winterizing. So if you are a person that grows African violets or you have hanging baskets, you're gonna feed those baskets with a, a fertilizer that the middle number is gonna be the high number. Like, a, like you might get a 10, 30, 10. That phosphorus is important to, for, to promote more blooming. And even in vegetable gardens, I mean, we're promoting blooming there so we get fruits and vegetables, right? And then the last number is the potassium, and that's just for general plant health. Annual plants do require a lot, large amount of phosphorus, which is that middle number. And phosphorus has gotten a bad rap. They've taken it out of a lot of products because of runoff into lakes, streams, ponds, algae bloom. But I gotta tell you, the home gardener is not the fault about this. This is mostly an agricultural issue. So don't be put off by that. The phosphorus that we put in our, our gardens is there, um, and it's not really going too far. I mean, when you're fertilizing, you wanna make sure you're doing a good, thorough job, but a clean job of it. So after you fertilize your lawn, go back, sweep it up. Let it get back on the lawn instead of going down the drain. You know, Water it in if you don't have rain expected. So that's a little bit about fertilizer. If you're fertilizing perennials, you can fertilize them now, and then again, you know, in six weeks. So basically, or things like hostas, once they start coming, it's good to get that product down, whether you're doing an organic feed or a fertilizer, be once before the leaves get out there, because it makes it just a little bit easier to fertilize those products before the growth emerges, okay? And now we're going to be uh, looking at some of those creatures that are waking up in our yards and gardens too. We see them, we're gonna try to learn a little bit more about them and by learning a little bit, we're gonna hope that we can deter them from coming to our yard and our garden. So this part, part of the program I call Know Thine Enemy. So yeah, we have the, we have the, the ready, ready mode culprits there, the, the uh, chipmunks, the skunks, the raccoons, deer, rabbits, and the last one is a mole down here in the corner here. And they do visit your yard. And hopefully you can, by lear learning a little bit about them, you can help prevent some of the am damage to your yard and garden. Look at that, isn't he the cutest little thing? They got, they're really hoarders. They put all those seeds in their faces. They are small, but they are very mighty in the damage that they can do. You can see he's got some holes in dry ground, about two inches. A lot of these small mammals will make two inch holes, so you don't know who's really down there, but be aware somebody, if you see holes appearing in your landscape, somebody's got a tunnel down there. They will actually uproot um, plants in a pot on your deck. They'll cut off the tops of tender annuals and things. So they can do a lot of damage, that little chipmunk guy. They also, they live in about a, they have a range of over about a half acre. So guess what? They're your outdoor pets because they're not going anywhere. They're just there. Um, they eat everything, they're omnivores, so they'll eat nuts and plants and bugs. And they are not true hibernators, because I'm sure you might have seen them running around your yard this winter when you had a nice sunny day, and we've had a lot of those. So they are very territorial though, and they will defend their burrows. And one chipmunk, I thought this was kind of interesting, can gather up to 165 acorns a day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're hungry. Here's our really good Easter bunny, the Easter cottontail rabbit. Um, they are also cute little animals that do a lot of damage. Here's some examples of rabbit damage. They will chew off tender transplants, things that you're putting out in your, in your garden, like this, maybe a green cabbage, or maybe it's a dahlia or something going on in the middle picture. Um, they'll strip the bark on the trees, and they'll also make very precise clean cuts so if you have animal damage and you see a 45 degree cut on your stems, it's a rabbit. Also look at where the damage is. Is it low to the ground? Is it higher? I mean, rabbits can stand on their hind legs and still you know, chew on things, but they can do a lot of damage because they eat only plants, but they eat a lot of plants. They can run in a zigzag pattern very quickly and they'll live anywhere up to five years. And they do remain active most of the year. 
this was kind of fun, one pair of rabbits can produce as many as 350,000 babies in five years, which is with a mortality rate at almost zero. So no wonder why we're getting, I get rabbit damage in my yard. I've already put down uh, netting around my uh, hydrangeas. They'll, they'll chew and you'll see it. And you'll be like, darn it. And it's the, it's the rabbit. Our next guy is the raccoon bandit. They are cute. But they, they, they have very dexterous hands and they definitely open up your garbage containers, looking for insects. They're looking for homes for their babies. And they do a lot of damage like this. They, they do strip the bark of the trees too, looking for bugs mostly, because they're carnivores, they eat a lot of meat. They're also digging holes in your turf, looking for grubs and bugs. And then just when your tomato is ready and you're gonna leave it one more day, along comes a raccoon and takes out one chomp off of it. He doesn't eat the whole thing or tear it off the plant. One chomp, it's gone. You're not gonna eat it then. So those are some of the uh, pictures of raccoon damage. And like I said, they will eat plants and fruit and veggies and their garbage. They li like to live in warm, dry places underneath decks and sheds. So they are most active at night, but they are active year round. Most of the damage we see is in late winter because they're looking for new nesting sites and they can live about 10 years. And they are carriers for rabies. So that's not so good. Our next guy is the skunks. The skunks have a lot of personality. By that I mean aroma. They are visiting our yards and they've actually been in my yard already. I think I had one behind my shed because you could smell it a month ago when it got warm. So these, everybody's waking up. And the, the skunks the smell is very fragrant. You can try to get rid of them with castor bean, peppermint. There's a lot of different things. You try to maybe fill the void where your shed is so they can't get underneath. That's another idea. They are carnivores and they will eat just about every meat, berry that they can find. They are not territorial and they'll often winter with other skunks to keep warm. Their spray can go up to 15 feet. So the breeding season, which this when I saw my skunk in my yard, it was in March, but it goes to mid-April. And this is the time that most dogs get sprayed because these skunks are looking for another place to go. So that's their defense mechanism. They're going to spray. The number one killer of skunks is the car. And this was interesting. The only animal that will eat <laughs> A skunk is the great horned owl because it has no sense of smell. So another visitor to our yard might be this little guy. And uh, you can tell he's little because he's in somebody's hand. This is a mole. This is an eastern mole. And they can do a lot of damage to our, our landscape. We might not even see them, but we just, we do see their damage. We also have another creature here, just kind of a cool creature. The star nose mole on the right, he's got this appendage on his nose that they're looking for insects and food in the ground. So he's feeling around. They're practically blind for most purposes. So they're using their claws and their append on his nose to look for those insects that they call food. But the star nose mole will go deeper into wetter soil. So you might find him if you have a pond or a natural area, whereas the eastern mole, you're going to have in your yards. I'm going to show you a couple little things about the difference about a mole and a vole because it kind of confuses people. So the voles look like a mouse. They have little ears and a tail. Um, you can see their eyes. The moles, they don't have, you really can't see their eyes or ears. They have a long front nose, the moles, like a snout. And they eat, these moles eat worms, grubs, and insects. But the voles eat everything. They eat the roots of your plants. They'll eat the, the leaves of your plants. They'll burrow in the ground and they can do damage to your shrub, to the roots of your shrubs. So I think the vole, even, it, even though they're kind of a cuter looking predator or animal out there, can do more damage to our gardens. The, the, the voles are brown like a little field mouse. 
Yeah, so they, there is some confusion about, but they're mostly on the ground. That's the biggest thing. You'll probably see them on the ground. And I'm gonna just show you this picture of the mole damage is on the left. They'll upheave the lawn. And the vole damage, they have like created little channels in your lawn. So that's a, a key indicator uh, what to look for. They're both shy creatures. We may not even see these creatures. On occasion, I've seen a mole in my yard running because it was pretty shady so they would sometimes run from one area to the next but a lot of times we don't even we don't even know we have them there once again the moles are carnivores the voles eat everything the voles live everywhere the moles want to be underground the voles are active day and night and the moles are more nocturnal at night the damage the moles do is underground, these underground burrows and tunnels, and the damage the voles can do is to your plants, your roots, shrubs, things like that. So they're very small, but they're, they can create a lot of damage in our yards. The last animal I'm gonna get to is the, the largest animal that might visit our yard, and they usually do. I've talked to groups all over the county. They're everywhere. It's not because you're in Mentor, it's not because you're in Wycliffe, it's not because you're in Madison, they're everywhere. They are very grand and majestic, but they are very cute, but they do a lot of damage by eating our plants. Uh, a lot of us call this deer candy, these hostas, daylilies, things like that. They'll eat just about anything to survive. They're plant eaters, we're gonna get to that. They can do other damage too by rubbing the trees. A lot of times they're rubbing to shed off their, the velvet of their antlers, so you might they do this in the spring. So uh, you might find some antlers at the base of some of these trees, sometimes. But the bad news is if they ring this entire tree, the tree is now dead because you've interrupted the flow of xylem and everything that this tree needs to survive. So you might have to wrap your trees, things like that. I know I do in my yard. The white-tailed deer, guess what? He's an herbivore, he only eats plants, but he eats a lot of plants. He can run very fast up to, and he can jump 10 feet vertically from a, just from a standing position. So they, you need a big fence to keep them out. They can eat things that are poisonous to humans. They have a four chambered stomach like a cow. So they, they eat the tough plants. Like you wonder why they're eating your holly, but they'll eat your holly if they're hungry enough. At the schoolhouse that I manage, they eat the holly there but their stomach will be like a cow. They'll ruminate the food and then they'll come back, they'll rest and then they'll go out and eat some more. The average age is five years and a male can weigh up to 200 pounds and the female, I mean 300 pounds, the female can go up to 200 pounds. So what do we do? <laughs> Once again, it's your tolerance level. Uh, what else can you do to deter these animals? I know I use cages. Over my, ten I, I tend to break their pattern. Deers are uh, creatures of habit. So if you can break their pattern a little bit. In the spring I live on a cul-de-sac, so the side yards are very small, very, you know, not very wide. But the deer come running right through there and the turf is very wet. So they're really doing a lot of damage to the turf there. So what I simply lay down like a piece of stiff fencing on the grass, they don't like it. They just will go another way. I mean, they'll, they'll still get back to where they want to go, but they won't rip up my grass in the process. So you can try to deter them with sprays and noise and dogs and pellet guns, <laughs> but, but they are, there's not a lot we can do. Remember, we cannot trap animals and release them. It's illegal in Ohio to do so. So once again, what is your threshold for damage? I cover my daylilies when they're emerging, like now, and they won't, they'll go another way, the deer predominantly, or the rabbits. But then once the daylilies start blooming, they're back. <laughs> you can only do so much with sprays and repellents and things. So good luck, and we just want you to know about that. One of the uh, last things we're gonna talk about briefly is composting. Soil that has compost added to it is always improved vastly. You can improve the clay soil by adding compost, compost because you're creating air spaces. You can improve sandy soil because it will better hold water, water better water retention. So a good compost pile is very important and if you can afford to get one in there, it doesn't have to be a formal thing. It can just be in a corner of your yard where you can get a hose to because sometimes you want to water this in dry spells. But you can put a lot of these products in there. Basically you're keeping a ratio 50 
50% green, 50% brown materials. So if you have a lot of leaves in the fall, you can't all just dump them in there because <laughs> it'll be an overwhelming brown amount in your compost pile. You can add a lot of things into your compost pile. You do not want to add any meat products, any grease, any baked goods, things like that, dairy. So, um, but you can put your coffee grounds and things like that. You can make a one bin or two bin. So it does help improve your soil. You can buy compost, but if you can make it, it's the best thing you can do for your soil. And then it's free to you in your yard. Just gotta remember to put it out afterwards. So mulching is another thing we wanna always do in the spring. Well, let's think about this. If we mulched two weeks ago, what would we be doing? We would be keeping the cold in the soil. The soils are not warm yet. So we try not to mulch until about June around here because mulches have been available. They're there at the gas stations, the garden centers, but June would be a better time to put the mulch down, reducing the weeds, conserving the moisture, stabilizing the soil. Like I said, the, and once we put it down, we wanna keep the soils you know, temperate. We don't want them baking in spots or too cold in other spots. It also does improve the beauty of your landscape. However, don't put them down more than two inches thick is a general rule of thumb. And always keep them about six inches away from the trunks and the stems of your plants. If you push the mulch up to the uh, stems and the trunks of your plants, you're creating another area for disease and insects to get in. So no volcano mulching, like our one extension agent used to say, because that's what he called it when you put these, a lot of landscapers push the uh, mulch right along the tree. If, they, if your landscaper does that, come out and just push it down around. Don't leave it up there. Uh, and the, be the best mulch to use are hardwood bark mulches, not the recycled wood products. So there's also organic mulches and inorganic mulches. Organic mulches uh, would be compost, manure, peat moss, pine needles, things like that. These eventually break down, organic. The inorganic mulches would be things like stones, gravel, fabric, black film. Um, these do not break down ever. And until you remove them, they're gonna be there. So they both have different applications in your yard and you just have to choose what works best for you. I can warn you though, my son moved into a house in Parma with this garden, beautiful garden area, but he went to Rototill. Guess what was under there? He had black fabric under there, under about this much soil. We had to dig out the soil because that, that black fiber is not going anywhere. You have to remove it. And then we got rid of the, the fabric because you can't rototill, obviously. So, so when is it safe to put out all these plants and do all this gardening? Well, and here's where I'm gonna throw some different things at you again. Our last frost date used to be May 15th. They redid the climate zones last year in 2023. The reason they did that was because we're we're getting trying to adjust to the climate change that we're all seeing. We had I've eaten on my deck five times already. I mean, you know, we've had warm weather in March. So half of the country went into a warmer half zone. And here in Ohio, we now have uh, basically four zones. We, 5A, which is where most of us are along the lake. Then we've got 6A and 6B. And the very tip of Ohio where we get to the little, like, little heart tip is a tropical zone, 7A. This is showing an increase of zero to five degrees in temperature fluctua fluctuations. They're also saying, and this is what the research says, that our last possible frost date has now been moved up to May 2nd. Now, I'm here to tell you that. I'm not going to tell you to put your tender annuals or your plants or your flowers out then, because I, I mean, this is research, but you know, we're also seeing big fluctuations. We've had warm weather, we've had cold weather, we've had snow, uh, we've, you know, we've had 70 degree days. I think I, I, a lot of the farmers in our area don't even plant until Memorial Day weekend. So that's a whole month difference from May 2nd. So I'm, I'm letting you have this information with a, a taste of caution because it's a little, to me, I'm not doing that. I'm not planting in May 2nd, especially not tender annuals. That you spend a lot of money. I'm sure these plants are not 
cheap anymore. Things, everything's gotten more expensive. So just be advised things are changing. We'll have to wait and see, I guess, is what, what I'm going to say. So I'm just going to leave you with a couple pictures of my yard before the tornado, <laughs> which, <laughs> which these slides have been in this presentation for years. That's why I have these pictures. When the tornado hit, this is out the south side of my landscaping. Um, and my house is kind of where I'm standing here. All these trees were either knocked down by the winds or sheared off at the tips. So we lost over 20 trees here big ones there's huge double and they weren't rotten I had only had maybe one we and before this we had cut down trees in February last February because I had a hemlock it was just such an annoying tree I was constantly it was in the middle of the lawn I was constantly cleaning up the not the hemlock I'm sorry a hickory with the nuts and I was constantly cleaning up these nuts from from May until September or later so we finally said please and I've been hit by a nut in the head it hurts it hurts from these big trees. So we finally cut down the hickory, which is like over here in my yard. We cut down three trees that needed to go in February, and then the tornado came in August. <laughs> so, but I'm here to tell you, we didn't uh, grind the stumps down of the one tree that was about 20 feet away from this path in this direction. And I, we had been using it to have little fires. and we, So I had a little uh, pyramid of you know twigs and stuff ready for the next fire when this tornado came. and did all this damage over here, it never even touched the pyramid of sticks. <laughs> That's how weird tornadoes are, so <laughs> just a little bit. But, uh, but yeah, we lost the tree house, which was, we called it the tree, it used to be the kids' playhouse, and so we just dropped the sides once they got big. And it was always tucked in the woods, now it's like, it looks like a chicken coop or something, because it's right in the middle of nothing. The path got destroyed, um, all these it was, it was very interesting to see what survived. This is another, so actually these pictures were taken, my daffodils are still not in full bloom yet, because it's been so, I have the late variety, the more, the, these all came from my mother-in-law and her garden over the years. But, so these are a couple spring inspirational pictures. This one is not my yard, <laughs> but it's beautiful and it's included here to kind of get you some inspiration because we only get so many good springs and years of gardening in our life. So let's enjoy it and make this the best one ever. So thank you all for coming. I'm gonna leave this information up if you need to copy that hotline number. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll take them now. We good? Did you have a question? Yeah. Well, I think any tree, like I, I did buy some trees in the fall. <laughs> uh, I was waiting to see what comes up in this yard because I, it was all naturalized. I had native plants in there. Um, but then these guys that had to come and take these trees out and grind the stumps down, they were all over. So I don't know what's coming, you know, or not. But um, the trees that I put in were on sale. Gales, I think, had a sale in the fall. I got some good prices. I bought like six maples. <laughs> it was like a drop in the bucket to, into my side yard there. But um, even with that being said, you're gonna have to stake those trees for wind and then protect them for deer damage and other, yeah. So any young tree you're gonna plant because it's an investment and I'm leaving my fences up on my six trees all year because the deer aren't gonna go away. and. And the other thing is if you don't do that, you're gonna have to like some of my other trees in my yard, I have uh, like a polyvinyl plastic fencing around the trunks themselves because a deer will come and they'll, you know, they're amorous in the fall and they're like crazy. So they're rubbing trees, marking their set trails and stuff. So anything that you put in there, um, and a lot of plants will adjust to uh, the wetness, but it's just a matter of, you're gonna have to still give it some protection from the damaging critters and, 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 and if you have a sunny area, that's probably most trees would go with like that as opposed to a shady area. Yeah. What's the thinking these days on rototilling to do it, when not do it, when to do it, when not do it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, a lot of people are not rototilling. If, they, if your garden has been prepared over and over and over every year, 
there's probably not a lot of need to rototill it again. If you have good soil that's, you know, if you can get out to your soil and they say you can pick it up and it crumbles in your hand, that's pretty good soil, you know. Yeah, then you might want to think about adding some amendments to the soil uh, to break up that clay. But a lot of people aren't, they're saying not to rototill as frequently. So it's one, once again, it's, it's what your preference is. Um, we don't rototill. I, my community garden, well, they come and rototill like once. I want to say twice, but I, I'm giving them a benefit of the doubt. They haven't rototilled since I left it and since last October. So um, they're going to rototill now, I'm sure, when they can. And then when I come in, we put up our fences the first thing. We don't rototill. A lot of people will come out with rototillers and rototill, but we just kind of smooth out the furrows from the big plows going through the garden um, and the soils are just fine. So it's a matter of preference. They're finding that a lot of times when things are rototilled we're, we're killing other beneficial things in the soils and depleting the soils of some, you know, cr the air spaces and things. So I, I understand what you're asking but there, you know it depends. Are you used to doing that? Does your husband want to do that every year or you know? Oh you do? I would not do it this year. See what happens. No, you can break it. You can break up the clay um, with like peat mosses and things like that. Composts, like we talked about, compost um, products like that that will help to break down the clay. Um, you don't really. I mean, unless you have like, if it's all clay, but. A lot of our soils are clay. I don't, I don't live in North Mentor where it's sandy. I live in, you know, Middle Mentor where it's, we got clay. So you just, over the years, and if you've had this garden spot for a while, if you've amended over the years, your soils get pretty good by adding those, you know, components back in there. So hopefully that will help you a little bit. Good luck with your shoulder. <laughs> yeah, question? What do you do with um, sandy soil? Yeah, well, once again, you can add components to the sandy soil, like your compost, manure, organic. Uh, you have it, and it's still sandy. It's still very sandy, isn't it there? It's just the, 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 the soil straight that we have. Six inches you've been down, and it's still not helping with the... Yeah, I, I, you have to just keep be diligent at it is all I can really tell you to kind of over time, uh, given time, effort, and energy, hopefully that will change. Yeah? I have hydrangeas in my yard that come up, I planted a while ago, they come up at the, at the end of summer, early fall, but I've been seeing some white ones out now. Are there different um, hydrangeas that bloom different times of the year? And if I bought these white ones that I saw, can they plant them now? I think you're probably not seeing hydrangeas blooming now. You might be seeing a viburnum blooming now. Oh, I'm sorry. My, mine aren't blooming now, but I saw some white ones in the store. Oh, well, you know what? They did bring them out for the Easter trade. Yeah. You know, so uh, you have to be careful about that. They're not as, they're not grown to be hardy. They're grown for, you know, bringing over for Easter. Now, I'm not saying you can't do it, but I'm gonna, it's going to take a little bit of work. Like one year, we bought a bald and burlap tree. Holy cow, I'm never doing that again. I mean, we had to dig the hole first. It was freezing cold. It's been in my house. You could only have it for so many days. There, there's just a lot of circumstances. Then once you put it out there, you got to make sure it's watered. We put, <laughs> my son, my kids were little then. We put a light under the, we tarped it. <laughs> <laughs> put a light under to warm it. I mean, it's like you do crazy things, but so you can try to get these hydrangeas from the Easter trade to root and and sometimes it's easier to take cuttings of that plant and you know, if you can do that and, and get them to grow that way as opposed to planting. So once you plant it outside, it hasn't been hardened off. You know, it's, it's used to a hothouse being grown in a hothouse or a greenhouse, lots of light, lots of heat. Then we put them into our environment and not so not so hot or warm or n maybe not as much sun even as they're used to so yeah I would caution you about that and there are many hydrangeas that do bloom there's so many hydrangeas now they've kind of hybridized them um, just 
there, there's labels attached to everything when you go to buy plants read the labels see what it's good to the zones that it's hardy for what light conditions how far to plant it so what kind of soil it likes so those um, labels are the law and they do give you a lot of information about the plants that you are purchasing this spring. So, yeah. I have a butterfly bush. It's a miniature one. It's starting to sprout, but I have a lot. How do I prune that? I have, I'm afraid to cut it because I don't want it to be too big. Is it growing a lot already? Yes. Oh, okay. It's in front of the house by the front door. Okay. It's the best, in general, the best time to prune anything is once it's done flowering. So like the forsythias, once they're done, then prune them. The um, hydrangeas, when they're done, typically, that's when you can harvest the, um, the mop heads. So if your butterfly bush is going to be blooming in the summer, I would wait until late summer to prune it. Okay. And that, or if you prune it now, you might be sacrificing some of the bloom. Yeah, um, sort of like our azaleas are going to be blooming now. You don't want to cut them down now unless there's some reason it's in the way, it's in the path of your car, I don't know. But you want to enjoy the bloom. And then after they're done blooming, then is the time, the appropriate time to trim those bushes. As opposed to the Rosa Sharon. Rosa Sharon are going to be blooming in the fall, late summer, early fall. So we want to, tr everything, I trim those when they're done. You don't want to sacrifice the bloom, I guess is what I'm saying. You can, you can cut up to a third. You can divide that up by cutting into the plant or cutting over the plant or, or a combination of, you know, cut a few in, but as long as you don't remove more than one third of the plant, your plant will be fine. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome.